Don't forget that you can now listen to the Politocrat podcast on Audible at audible.com and wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe now and thank you for your support. Welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Thursday, December 10th. 2020. On this edition of The Politocrat, credibility. Where has it gone? Media, politicians. Was credibility ever there? Is it something to do with social media? Is it getting worse or better? The decline of credibility. Coming up next. Welcome back. I want to take this in three stages. Well, roughly three stages. Credibility. Credibility in media, credibility in any semblance of political leadership. Where have those things gone? Were they ever in evidence? Or is it something very 21st century? Is it the pandemic that has absolutely as people put it, uh, exposed what behaviors people in positions of prominence and anyone else for that matter has always manifested, have always exhibited or is it something else that's going on? Is it some kind of other reveal about us as people, as human beings that brings this out? Is it something about libertarianism? I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think I, I can have some guesses. We can all have some guesses, you, me, everybody. Do you see there being an issue with credibility in, not just in America, but anywhere? I mean, we know here in the United States, (laughs) I mean, my goodness, with the so-called administration that you've got 41 more days of. 41 more days of this. But we we are getting to the finish line. First, we've got to get to the end of this year before we get to the end of him in the White House. And that's a small H for him. Not a big one. Not a large one. I know some people do think he's God. But he's not. What's going on? Why is it that we now are seeing what we're seeing? Is this some kind of last primal scream of white male Dominance? Is that what this is? I mean, I I really don't know. It seems to be. Where is the responsibility? Where is it? Let's start with the US. Where is the responsibility? You had Joe Biden winning the presidential election by 7.1% million votes. And by the way, they are still counting the votes. I mean, only 99% of the vote is in. So you still have that 1% to count. Joe Biden has an over 7.1 million vote lead. He has 306 electoral college votes. He has... 
a near five percentage point lead. He won over 81 million votes, the most ever in the history of elections for president in the United States of America. The most ever. 81 million plus votes and counting. The other guy got 74 million. And he has problems with math, you see. And maybe he has problems with meth, too. But, um, you know, I know people are having some serious problems with that. And I'm not trying to make light of it. As it regards the other guy who got the 74 million votes, he has problems with math. His maths are just all messed up. He seems not to realize that 81 million votes is more than 74 million votes. No wonder he had Michael Cohen try to block release of his Fordham University academic transcripts. There is no such thing as credibility when it comes to the other guy. And the other guy has 41 days of disgrace to exhibit in the White House. And he's screaming. He's yelling. He's doing it for his base. Lying. Gaslighting. Where's the credibility? There's none. He's obviously got none. He's never had any. I've always said this. This guy was never a leader. He was a destroyer. And what America did, voted, was to vote for a destroyer. That's what they did. And in both cases, he lost the popular vote. This time by an even larger margin. The truth is, the United States of America never, never approved of Donald Trump. At least not the voters. The majority of voters did not approve of him. Now, the majority of white people voting approved of him on two election cycles. That definitely happened. The majority of white people did approve of Donald Trump in 2016 and in 2020. That is documented. When all is said and done, however, the majority of people voting overall, and when people include black, Latinx, Asian American, Native American, I can go on and on. Some white people, some, you know, progressives. They rejected Donald Trump. Rejected him. And the reality is, is that the corporate news media have been playing the game of the other guy for 50 years. And what I have said before is that the corporate news media here in the United States and in other countries, but particularly and specifically here in the U.S., is eroding the notion of truth and actual facts by repeating the mantra of Donald Trump and the Republicans. Why would you continue to talk about whether or not Donald Trump should be conceding. Why is that a conversation? You do know, and the media knows, 
the concession of a general election is not a requirement for the person who wins that election to take power. It is a ceremonial thing. It is a symbolic thing. It is a thing of nicety that signals to the rest of us in the world, not just in the country, that there is a so-called quote-unquote peaceful transfer of power and the concession is an inherent part of that. It's the predicate. It's not the end. It's not the be-all. It's not the end-all. And it's not the only thing. But it is part of that building block of what is called a transition. It marks the symbolic start of a transition. But if it was all about concession, and if it was a rule somewhere that concession was required, we'd never have a new person in the White House. Nobody would concede. Nobody would concede. In fact, concession is not a requirement in any election in the United States. And I'm not quite so sure that it is anywhere else in the world. Roy Moore never conceded. He still didn't concede from 2017. For very different reasons, Stacey Abrams did not concede in 2018. And those reasons are very clear. But some of the Republicans and some people in the media use her example for false equivalency purposes. Well, Stacey Abrams didn't concede. But little do they know. Oh, oh, by the way, they know very well that the reason why Stacey Abrams did not concede was a fundamental issue about the electoral process in the Secretary of State's office and the purging of votes of black people. A Republican thing, because, you know, they love to do that. And all of those dozens of thousands of black people's votes that Greg Palast and the ACLU had to actually sue to get put back and get those names of those voters put back on the rolls and released so that we could all see. And those voters who were removed from that 2018 governor's race between Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp, who was, by the way, the Secretary of State in Georgia. So we could see all of that stuff. We could see all those black people who had been removed from the voting rolls. That is a very different thing from what Donald Trump is doing. That's a very different thing. What Donald Trump is doing is committing a crime right in front of you and right in front of me. When you are trying to actually engineer, not even engineer, when you are trying to achieve a coup right before everybody's eyes, you are engaging in a criminal activity and in a treasonous activity. That's really how this should be characterized. But that's what I talk about when I go back to credibility, the Republican Party, who really are the ones engineering all this, they're not lead. He's not leading them. They're leading him. And there are people in the corporate news media, not just on Fox, by the way, some on CNN, some of these Republican commentators on there, some on MSNBC. Well, not M- not not really MSNBC, but particularly on CNN. The Rick Santorums of the world. The John Kasichs of the world. And, well, up, up until recently, the Van Joneses of the world. 
who ride along with this credibility and ignorance, a credibility deficit that the corporate news media has in general. Now, not everybody in the corporate news media, and when I say corporate news media, what I am looking at particularly is 24-hour cable. And I find, quite frankly, if you sit down and watch this, and I watch it because, in part, and mostly because of the kinds of episodes that I do here on this podcast. And sometimes, though, I turn this stuff off because you have to. Because it is like an indoctrination hammer. And I'm not saying that indoctrination as in gaslighting you when it comes to the corporate news media's reports. What I am talking about when I say indoctrination hammer is this repeated bludgeon of the same limited, limiting information. It doesn't teach you how to think. It doesn't give you a scope of the world. It gives you only the United States. There is no global village. And if it is, it's always defined in terms of technology. We don't get to know about what's going on in the rest of the world. And if there is news about the rest of the world, you've got to be up very early in the morning or very late at night to watch it. And it's usually coming out of CNN International in Atlanta. That's where it's coming from. That's about all the real international news you will ever get on CNN. This credibility issue with these pundits, and it's all opinion. I've talked about this before. I'm not going to go down that particular road on this episode. But all of this talk, talk, talk with no critical thinking. We don't have any critical thinking in this. Well, we do have some, but we generally do not. And I think the issue is, is that we also need more of critical thinking. That's not the issue. That's the solution. We need more critical thinking and we need to speak less in sound bites. Social media has accentuated the soundbite culture. We've all fallen victim to it. I hesitate to use that word victim, but I used it. Because what you're seeing in the Republican Party, what you have seen, what you're seeing from Donald Trump is this era of victimhood. So I don't want to present those two things like they're the same thing. But we are all people who are survivors. And that's probably not the best word either. We are people who are under assault from soundbite culture. I think that's perhaps the better term to use of the ones I have used. The best one to use is we are under assault. It's a relentless assault. Heck, I've done it. I've I've put clips of this very podcast on Twitter. And it's usually, well, the clips average a minute and a half to two minutes. Now, is that soundbite? Yeah, it probably is. I would say it is. A lot of clips I see on Twitter for other podcasts and other programming is between 30 and 45 seconds long. And I do find that if you put shorter clips, more people will listen to them. And if you put on longer clips, less people perhaps are inclined to listen. And it may not be because they just don't have the time to listen to that extra 45 seconds. It might just be that, heck, I only want a digest of information that lasts a minute or less. And if I see that your clip, and I'm just saying this in a general sense, not me personally. And if I see that your clip is a minute and 45 seconds then I won't listen to it. I'll tune out. Heck, by the time it gets to a minute, I'm done. I'm finished. And that kind of, to me, that's a shortening of the mind. That is a shortening 
of the mind, in a way. And you're training your mind to continue to do that. It's like eating bad food. Food that feels good and tastes good. Ooh, I love that. You know? And then you get this withdrawal. Because, my goodness, if you have to eat some broccoli or some kale, you can't deal with it. Because if you've been eating all the stuff that feels good, it's comfort food, kale, broccoli, what the heck is that? We need a different mental diet, is my point. And that is the solution. We need... A different mental diet. So that we can think more openly, more critically, more analytically. Which is the same thing as critical thinking. So that we aren't led with this kind of ridiculousness. This erosion of facts. And this erosion of truth. And adopting these terms like alternative facts, like Kellyanne Conway did. And that term kind of slipped away. And then it was fake news. And then everybody's repeating that. Even the news organizations that call themselves credible, that we look at as credible. Calling, using that name, using that term over and over. And not giving the context. I've talked about this. We need more context. In media, if you're not going to give us longer sound bites, if you're not going to give us clips that last more than a minute and a half, and there are some broadcasts that occasionally will, but it's usually in service of sensationalism or faux outrage. Although I would say that Gabriel Sherman, you remember Gabriel Sherman, not Gabriel, Gabriel, Gabriel Sherman, the uh, vote counting supervisor, I believe, down there in uh, Georgia. When he made that uh, statement at his press conference last week, when he said this must stop. And he was talking about the violence and the threats of violence against officials, against a 20 year old who was just merely counting votes, a clerk counting votes, doing his job. And he gets death threats and gets nooses on his doorstep. I mean, we are living in a very fascist Nazi world in America. We do, And no one's talking about Nazis. See, that's another thing about context. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's, no one dares to bring that up. And again, as I said a week or two ago, that's an opportunity to educate your viewer. And you deliberately pass on it. Because perhaps your bosses don't want you talking like that. Because we've got a corporate network to run. We've got some money to make even though news has not really been a profiteering venture and it's only just started to be something that's been looked at as such in the last, what, 10 to 20 years or so? I don't know. But when Gabriel Sherman made that statement last week about this must stop and that's enough and these senators in Georgia need to speak up and Donald Trump, where are you? And that got played. I know on on some now, on MSNBC it got played, and they were playing three, four minutes of the statement. What if they had done that with some other issue that we really do need to hear a lot more about? they, they, They never will. We need credibility. And we need it now in media. And I and then again, my options also as another suggestion for people is to integrate integrate the media diet. With Free Speech TV at freespeech.org at Roland Martin, Roland Martin Unfiltered. He's on Twitter at Roland S. Martin. At Joe Madison, the Black Eagle on Sirius XM Radio. Really important program. Karen Hunter's program on Sirius XM Radio. Channel 126, by the way, for both of those. Karen Hunter and Joe Madison, Urban View. This is really good critical thinking and analytics that all of these uh, these two individuals, all three of them, Roland Martin included, offer. And there's news that gets talked about in the black community in particular that you don't hear on CNN or any of these networks. 
And you actually get to hear people who are black talking about these issues, not just when it comes to race, because that's really all that you hear when it comes to CNN and MSNBC. The only time you'll see black people on is when a black defense secretary gets nominated for that position is when there is some violence in the black community, is when some cop murders a black person, is when there's an issue about voting rights. That's probably, those are the only four or five times, three or four times that you're going to hear from somebody black on a network like CNN. But let me tell you, will you hear anything about, from black guests when it comes to economics, when it comes to education, when it comes to all of these other things? Very, very rarely. So we really need to have a healthier media diet. And there are other people, Randy Rhodes on, on, uh, on her show, and numerous others who I apologize for not being able to remember to name, uh, such as my uh, scattered brain. But this is what we must do. We need credibility in media. And it has to come quickly. Because you've got people in government right now, the Republicans, who intend to try this again with this coup attempt. And if the corporate news media doesn't stop equivocating and doesn't stop using the both sides issue, if it doesn't stop doing that, you are going to see a coup in this country and they will continue to act as if it's just another story. History will judge Donald Trump. And history will also judge the people who reported on him and how they characterized him. So I think we should change the media diet and make sure that credibility isn't just an empty word anymore. Credibility. Does that word mean anything to you as a person? I mean, I'm sure it does. Come on. I mean, that's a silly question to ask, isn't it? it sounds like a <laughs> sounds like I'm invisibly wagging my finger, doesn't it? You know, Mr. Moralizer. Credibility. Does it mean something to you? Well, <laughs> it does. It means something. It should mean something. I know it means something to you um, listening to, listening to this, listening to me. Um, it means something to me. I, I, uh, I can't imagine why it wouldn't mean anything to me. Um, but it means everything. It's about trust, isn't it? At the end of the day, dear listener, it's about trust. How do we get our information? How do we receive it? Who do we receive it from? These are ingredients for us to consider. And if we've got people in the news media who are doing things that not only defy credibility, but are downright, you know, in some ways criminal. I mean, maybe that's a little bit too harsh. Maybe that's a little too harsh. People are human beings. We're human. Now, I'm not condemning people being human. That's not what I'm even trying to do here. What I am, uh, I think, trying to do is just look at the situations. Think about this. And I apologize because, I I mean, what I'm going to say right now may um, cause some triggering. It really might. And I'm going to be as delicate and sensitive about this as I possibly can. Look at the people who have undermined your trust or at least made you wretch in horror. If you have any kind of scintilla of humanity in you. Matt Lauer. Charlie Rose. Les Moonves. 
Uh, I think I'll stop there. There's so many other names. I mean, I could read off names off the top of my head for the next 10 minutes. They're all in the media. They all were in the media. In your home. You know what they say? You know, I, I 10 years ago, I, for a fleeting 15 seconds, um, was a member of the Roger Ebert um Roger Ebert presents at the movies. And I really am grateful to Roger, um, who is dear, who is now departed. Um, and also to Chaz Ebert, um, who both of whom gave me that opportunity and Chaz Ebert, um, thankfully is still with us. And, and, uh, I, I want to thank her here. I thanked her in, um, uh, Um, more directly as well um, for the opportunity to talk about film, to, to do a presentation about Alfred Hitchcock. But that's not the point. The point is, is that just thinking about how we convey things and who we are when we convey them, what that says about us, And one of the things Roger said to me was, Omar, when you are speaking, because we're doing some auditions before I actually got on. We're doing some auditions. And and what Roger always said, when you look into that camera, when you are there, you have to speak to people as if you are in their homes. As if you are in their home, talking to them in their house. So you really want to be as careful, as professional, and as even keeled as possible. I'm paraphrasing that last part about careful. And I mean, the point is, he said that you don't want to rage and scream, (laughs) which sometimes you might find that I do. On some of these episodes that we all do to some degree on Twitter, but with not entirely good, I mean, with not entirely bad reason, I think it's a good thing. It's, well, maybe not. Um, It depends on what it is you're saying, but maybe not. I don't know. That's why it's good to turn social media off sometimes. (laughs) Oh, dear. But that's what he said. You have to... Talk to the camera as if you are literally in somebody's home. Because when you are, as if you are a guest in someone's home. That's, I think, the words he used. Because we are in someone's home when we are on television. As I was. For those, you know, 15 seconds of, hey, look at me. (laughs) When we were in somebody's home, we have a responsibility. And we have a responsibility to tell the truth. And also to carry ourselves in a certain way. But that's increasingly become not the way. And I don't know if the 19, it's 1976 movie, Network, I think it was 76. I don't know if the, and you should see that movie, by the way, Network. Because it really did. Paddy Chayefsky, who wrote that screenplay for the film directed by the great, late, great Sidney Lumet, um... He, Paddy Chayefsky had his finger on something when he wrote that. And he was streets ahead of, of the times. I mean, he really was when he wrote Network. And Network was one heck of a film about media, credibility, and, well, I don't want to give it away. I'm not really giving anything away. But you've got to see Network. Peter Finch in the iconic role, um, You've got to see the late, now the late Peter Finch. William Holden was in that movie, as I remember. Seen it a long time. I haven't seen it for years. Network. Faye Dunaway, Robert Duvall, Ned Beatty, or Beatty, I forgot how you pronounce his last. Um, Oh, God. You have to watch Network. Network is the movie to watch. If you don't, 
this weekend or whenever, if you've got some time for about two hours and change, or whatever, I forget what the running time of that movie was, please find yourself some time to watch Network. Faye Dunaway was excellent in that film too, by the way. Peter Finch was excellent. Um, you, I mean, you have to watch. I'll just leave it there. You have to watch Network. But the point is, is that Network has, is showing you where we are now. <laughs> you know, But that's not the... Uh, you have to watch the film. This is the thing that really does trouble me. Is that now media is trying to make money through news by doing all this opinionating, by eradicating the priority of facts. It's not so much that people want to get rid of facts, or at least not the, not the people who care about the news. The Republicans do. Donald Trump does, and all these people. They want to get rid of the news. They want to get rid of the facts. They want to propagandize and be the complete fascists that we know they are, and that they know they are. But what I'm trying to get to is, it's that there is a priority of opinion over news now in the news media, in the corporate news media, that is a real problem. An opinion-centric news media is not a healthy, positive news media. And that goes for Fox. It goes for these wackadoodle other right-wing stations. I'm not going to mention their letters. You know who they are. You know there's two others out there. One of them with letters to it, just the, you know three or four letters to his name, and the other one you know, with the word Max in it. And after that word, I'd put bullcrap. Because that's what it is. I, I cleaned up that last word because I'm trying not to um, curse. <laughs> Jeez. But there is a priority of opinion over fact. And that is what all of these networks, including CNN and MSNBC have gone for. They have the, and by the way, can I, can I say, and I really would love to speak to, because did you know that there is a, uh, a black woman who is going to be taking over at NBC? Excuse me, at MSNBC? I would really love to be able to talk to her um, and ask her some of these things, because she's going to be the first black woman, if she hasn't already started uh, taking over MSNBC to 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 uh, be the president or the of the network, I believe. I may have that slightly wrong. I forgot what the title, is. but she will be the uh, person coming in to oversee MSNBC, or to you know to be the uh, president of MSNBC or to be a network director. I forget, and uh, I sorry I did not. Um, because this is something I wasn't even planning to talk about. I was going to talk about this another time. Um, but it does come in the context of what I'm talking about. The answer is we need people. And I, and I hope that this particular lady is one of them. Who will reframe where we are with this. Speaking of credibility. We need to have a reframe of what the function of news is in America as well as beyond. But here in the United States, we need a reframe. We really do need a reframe. We have to start putting facts and truth and information ahead of all the opinionating. There's just too much of it. <laughs> here I am talking about, we've got to do that, and here I am on a podcast. Well, this is the place where you would do the opinionating. I mean, that's what podcasts do. At least some of, a lot of them do. Others, you know, engage with, do the entertainment bit. They do this, they do that, they do the other. But this is a, a forum for opinion and conversation. Podcast. Podcast. You can start one as well. And... The key is dedication and commitment to it. Setting aside a portion of your day. To do this. It's not as if I don't have other things to do. I do. <laughs> I do. It is about commitment. It really is. And you've got people in the news media who are committed to putting opinion over facts opinion over truth 
opinion being the first thing that they wake up to in the morning next to them in bed. It says, hello. Hello, opinion. Good morning. Good afternoon. And good night. I mean, that's where we are, aren't we? I mean, you can't get through a half an hour of news now in the United States without somebody opinionating about something. It wasn't always like this, and I know I go back to it all the time, don't I? 1996, Telecommunications Act, Bill Clinton and Al Gore. And 1987, nine years before that, with the Fairness Doctrine scrapped via the FCC, Ronald Reagan. That's why you have what you have now. Five corporations controlling 98% of what you hear, what you see, what you read. I know, it's depressing, isn't it? Welcome back. And what I was really trying to get to there is in the previous segment was if you've got people like Charlie Rose, if you've got people like Matt Lauer, Les Moonves, you know, Mark Halperin. And again, I told you I could read off more names and I don't have this list in front of me and this is all coming off the top of my head. But if you've got these people, Jeffrey Tubin, in the news media, Where's your credibility? I mean, where's your credibility? And all of them have, on a sliding scale, right? You'd probably put Jeffrey Tubin and what he did. I don't know. How would, I mean, I would put that at one end of a scale. And then I would put the kinds of things that Charlie Rose, Mark Halperin, Matt Lauer, Les Moonves did at a complete other end of the scale in terms of the how severe they are at the other end. At the very, very serious end. I mean, all of this is not good. None of this is, is good at all. It's very serious. But especially the those other people I just mentioned at the other end of the scale. That's what you do, right? You put Al Franken, and Al Franken used to be in the media, in fact, this and this was something that happened before he even got into politics. But all those other people, all those things, and I'm not even going to put Donald Trump in there. He was in the media too. He may yet start a media network. He is not going to run in 2024. He might announce that he's going to run, but he won't run in 2024. You can announce that the moon is made of green cheese, but it doesn't make it so. But... Back to this credibility issue. Because if you're going to claim that you are the number one name in news, the most trusted name in news, or we report, you decide, fair and balanced, and you've got people who are assaulting women, violating women, reporting on your network, giving news out on your network that they're locking women in in, uh, in their offices with some device at the underneath their desk. You've got Roger Ailes, he's no longer around, attacking women, physically attacking them. I mean, come on, this is the media and... On top of that, these are, you know, these are what, five or six white men I've just mentioned? And I'm sure that there are black men and other men who've done this too, who are doing this in the media. I mean, there's one in um, in the celebrity, uh, A.J. Calloway. You want to hear about his story? I don't have the time to repulse you about A.J. Calloway, a black man. Who did, who, who, and I, and I, you know, listen, you can go search, search AJ Calloway. And let, let the black women, um, 
of the world tell you about him, particularly the women that he did. Well, put it this way. Just go and search A.J. Calloway. But if you've got these other people um, in the news media, A.J. Calloway was, I think, Access Hollywood or one of these uh, Hollywood uh, programs on TV, these news magazines, Hollywood news shows on TV. But if you've got these people, where's the credibility? Where's the credibility? You are, and like Roger said, and I didn't quite finish that off from the last segment, how are you going to be in somebody's home? And you're talking like that, and you and you behave like that. Ah, uh, no, I'm no, I'm not being Mister Moralizer. I'm just trying to make a point. You cannot have this. I know that human beings are human beings, but this is inhumane. What these folks are doing. And Matt Lara had a what a twenty year career plus in news media. I remember when he used to do HBO. I remember when he used to do sports. That's how Matt Lauer, I believe, broke into the business. Sports news. New York. I watched him when I was in New York. This guy was evil. These people were were telling you what was what in the news. And there are their fair share of accomplices in all of this who are still in the news business. And I can go on about Harvey Weinstein who the news media were were saying, oh, he's a media mogul. Even when you had, what, 100 women, 200 women? Telling you that this man is a rapist. And you still had news stories going on about, well, you know, Harvey Weinstein is a media mogul. Really? Media mogul? This guy has been accused by 200 plus women or whatever it is now I've lost count do you know how many women have accused him of rape he's been convicted of rape if my memory serves me correctly and you still got people oh former mogul or for no just call him what he is he's a rapist and stop with this oh you're you're putting a title for his name See, this is what I'm talking about. It's the way also that the media is reporting about people like this. And I get it. Well, they're friends. Well, they're buddies. But that doesn't excuse anything. I don't care how much of a buddy the people in the news are with people like this. But it's got to stop somewhere. It's got to stop. These people are pigs. It's the nicest thing I can say about it. And I'm not trying to be nice. How do you want your news? Do you want it served with a layer of rapist? Or do you actually want people in the news who actually have a clean bill in their own endeavors personally? Now look, again, have people done things in life that may not be above board, of course, But people have not raped like these guys. These guys are rapists. That's a whole different affair. That's a whole different matter. And yet those are the people that are in power in the news business. That's what it is now. News industry. News cycle. It's all about a play and an orchestration. It's very molecular. It really is. But it's very dangerous. You've got people, I mean, it's different, right? You cannot, these are two different things. The fact that there are people on Fox News who are admitted alcoholics, or at least people in the news who say it on their air, on their own radio shows, that they are well-known alcoholics. And you know who I'm talking about. I've mentioned one of them. Since I've mentioned the men, I guess I could mention the women as well. Right. There is a difference. You can't put these things in the same category, so I'm not going to. Yes, we know that Judge Janine Pirro has a drinking issue. We know. 
And one person that I've mentioned already today, Randy Rhodes, has said this many times on her own radio show. Laura Ingram is a drunk. She's used those words. And everybody who operates in the news media knows it. And I'm not saying all of this as, hooray, hooray, I'm happy that they've got drinking problems. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that people have those kinds of issues. But I don't think that those issues get solved by putting people like that on air where they are openly drunk. I mean, Judge Janine Pirro, have you seen some of the highlight reel or the low light reel? But there's that. And remember Jessica Savage back in the day? Those of you of a certain age will remember Jessica Savage. What a tragic figure. Was really battling with a lot of things, a lot of issues. I think drug use, drug addiction, alcohol. And she was on the air. Um, and, and I don't know how the heck she kept it together. She barely, did. there was one thing that slipped, one or two things. And there's a, a video that I put on Twitter months ago. Um, where she uh, off 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 air had, but on camera had uh, really let these men, and they're all men, white men, producers of the news, know what, let, she let them have it. And for good reason, by the way. It's not like she was just, you know, behaving like some man ranting into oblivion. She let them know, look, why can't I have this here? I want that here. Where's the copy? Where's the, 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 the Chiron? This, this, that. And she, and, and, you know, but she was a really tragic figure. Now that's very different, right? From people like the people I mentioned, these men I mentioned. And it goes to credibility. It really does. What kind of people do we want reading the news to us. And quite frankly, where are the black folk reading news? Not, and I'm not talking about Lester Holt, that he's the one person daily. I'm talking about in multiple scenarios. And I don't mean these weekend opinion shows like AM Joy, which is now going to be Tiffany Cross's show on MSNBC. And then Jonathan Capehart has a show. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. Those are weekend shows. Well, congratulations to both of them. Tiffany Cross and Jonathan Capehart, very capable people. I've got no issue with that. That's not my problem. My, my problem is, is that we need more inclusion on a daily basis, a daily basis, daily basis. We need inclusion and networks putting black people on, on a daily basis with their own news shows. Their own news, have them reading news, have them anchoring. And I'm not talking Craig Melvin for one hour. Why did Reverend Sharpton get pulled back from a daily show? I don't know Joy Reid has a show every day now. But we should have more people having shows daily. We should have black folk having shows daily on these networks. And we should also have black news networks. And there is one. But it's obscure and, well, that's why I say Roland Martin, Karen Hunter, Laura Coates, who you see on CNN, who has her own show on uh, Sirius XM Channel 126. You can search all of these people that I'm uh, talking about. In fact, I will uh, link to some of them, too, so that you can see this stuff. I'm going to link to them. But this is the key. We need credibility. And we need, and the way that I think that starts is when you actually have a broader representation in the newsrooms, because the newsrooms are still 98% white. And the people making the decisions are white men. White men. And that has not changed in, what, 85 years of news, or whenever the heck the news business really got underway in the U.S. That's not changed. Not changed at all. I mean, here and there, you know, there's so much excavation to be done. I think that's what this is, too. And can we have black people who are going to change the mold, break the mold? Because you can have black people there who might just do exactly the same thing that all of these white men are doing. You know, and that's not good either, you know. 
I guess time will tell. And I think that media is going to have to change for credibility's sake. I could go on. I could go on about Kay Burley in the United Kingdom. I could go on about Beth Rigby, who's really disappointed me by violating these lockdown rules. I really, because I really like Beth Rigby. I genuinely uh, respect her. Well, I respect, I mean, I respect everybody in the, in the business as people I'm talking about, as people. Everybody on Sky News as people I respect. Uh, but I have a really, I have an affinity for Beth Rigby because she's a really great professional. Uh, and I really like her integrity. She's got a, an integrity about news in the UK. She is the best in the UK, I think, at um, political news. She's a political editor at Sky News, and she profoundly disappointed me this week when I found out that she um, broke the lockdown rules along with Kay Burley. And uh, this was really bad, by the way. And Kay Burley was yanked off the air on Sky News. Beth Rigby who has done some really good work. Oh my God. Always ask the right questions. Always ask the best questions. And she's got yanked off the air because she was at some party um, or something with, uh, I believe she was with um, celebrating uh, Kay Burley's 60th birthday. Uh, And Kay Burley apologized for it, but the damage has been done. And then you had two other Sky people, including Inzaman Rashid, who's a, a decent person too who I like. He's a decent, decent person. Really good too. He's a good pro as well. And I really respect him, admire his work, admire his uh, journalism. He's he's been very good. Uh, But unfortunately, he did the same thing. He's disappointed me profoundly as well. Human beings are human beings. I understand that. I've made mistakes. You've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. Hopefully, we all learn from them and we try to be better people going forward. But it is a credibility issue. You're reporting on Dominic Cummings, who was, and thankfully no longer is, Boris Johnson's senior advisor. His senior advisor. Well, you know, Dominic Cummings actually left the White House at the White House. (laughs) Yeah. Actually, that's probably where he would end up under in the final 41 days. Would that shock you? Would Would you be shocked if Dominic Cummings, who who nobody liked, by the way, at number 10 Downing Street, including Carrie Simmons, the uh, fiancé, um, who told her fiancé, you've got to get rid of this guy. I mean, she basically, she told him, Boris, you got to get, you got to let him go. Good for her. Good for her. You know, I think that's good. And he actually got rid of Dominic Cummings and the other guy, Lee, whatever his name is now, I forget. I don't remember his last name. Don't really care, actually, because they're both gone and they're both toxic. Both toxic. And the kinds of things they were saying to women and and actually to some men as well, it's just despicable. Come on now, we need decency again. Somehow, some way. We need decency. And Dominic Cummings, you know, he broke the lockdown rules back in April of this year, 2020. Went up to Durham Castle or County, uh, whatever. Was it Durham Castle or whatever? I always get it mixed up. Whatever. He went and broke the law, drove you know, 100 miles or whatever it was. And his excuse was, well, I wanted to test my eyesight. You wanted to test your eyesight? So you wanted to break, so you broke lockdown rules to do it. And then you ended up risking that in COVID when you have 63, 65 million people in the United Kingdom who are absolutely standing behind glass to see each other and they can't even do that. And then they've got loved ones that die alone for you to test your eyesight at County Durham or wherever the heck you went to Durham Castle or whatever the heck it is you went to. Really? I mean, is that what we're talking about? And then you have a press conference? He should have been out the door back in April. And the British public was screaming for him to go. And finally, finally he did. Months and months later, six, seven, eight months later, he went. 
seven months later, finally gone. My goodness me. But it was Kay Burley that was talking about, oh, Dominic Cummings, oh, how dare you? And then look at Kay Burley. Whew. Good grief. She's not on the air on Sky News anymore. At least, uh, according to reports of the Guardian newspaper today, Kay Burley has been taken off the air and will not come back till perhaps 2021, which is what, three weeks away? Well, we are now three weeks from the end of the year. Exactly 21 days from today, we will be at December the 31st. And I don't know about you, and I know some people, people hate, there are people who hate New Year's Eve. I've always loved New Year's Eve because it's a time to reflect and a time to look forward to the possibilities of what could come in the, in the upcoming year. Huh. And I did that last year. I looked back and reflected on 2019 and I was so excited, so excited, dear listener, about the prospects of 2020. And as I had fun and enjoyed life and had the champagne and had company and just tremendous times, little did I know what was coming in 2020. Let me tell you, my celebration in exactly three weeks from today, Thursday, December the 31st, 2020, that's knocking on wood. I am going to freaking live it up. (laughs) Because if you can, you should. But not with people outside your circle. That is not going to cut it. I am not going to make the mistake that Kay Burley has made. Is it a mistake? Shouldn't she know better? If she and others would criticize Dominic Cummings as a politician, shouldn't she in the media and others in the media who've done this know better? I mean, if anything, as I say, going back to the Roger Ebert thing, these folks are coming into your homes. More people listen to them than to the politicians. I mean, more people listen to the media uh, folk and the news folk and trust them or believe them or listen to them than they do the politicians. That's what I think. I mean, more people watch them on a daily basis than they do go to the websites of uh, the YouTube pages of all these politicians. Don't you think? I mean, I think so. Have to be the case, wouldn't it? Look, I don't know what you think. I've only told you what I think. And I think that we cannot have media people or politicians behaving in these ways. Whether it is obviously in the cases of the outright criminal, violent behavior of Matt Lauer and Harvey Weinstein, and Charlie Rose, and I talked about that. And I condemn that. We need to end toxic masculinity. That's what that must be. And the patriarchy upholds it. I I, I raised this with um, Ruth Ben-Ghiat last week. I mean, none of this stuff with all of these fascists and these so-called these strongmen, uh, you know, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't exist without patriarchy holding them up. The patriarchy is part of their very existence. Same thing with all of these Charlie Rose and all of them. Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby was in the media. Remember that? He had a show called The Cosby Show. He's behind bars, where he should be. And he got people apologizing for him on social media. Huh. Credibility. Credibility. You, 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 come on, you can't have it. And you got, you got, then you got politicians here in the United States breaking lockdown rules, not wearing masks. Giuliani, he's not a politician anymore. He's a clown, he's a jackass. I oh, you know. 
I know he's got coronavirus. He'll live. I'm not rooting for him to fail here. I want the guy. Hey, I walked practically walked right into him 20 some odd years ago down the street in New York. This is actually, I actually practically walked, I actually walked past and, and said hello to and smiled at JFK Jr. years ago down uh, on 59th Street. Actually, it was 66th Street. Walking down a, uh, no, it was 59th Street. Walking down the, uh, tr- it's funny, I always seem to meet, inadvertently, meet politicians and there's no one else around, you know, stab with Giuliani um, years ago. No one else was on the street, it's just me and him. And I just did, I, I just looked at him and he's smiling, his chest is puffed out. You know, I talked about this on Twitter, by the way, a few, couple of weeks ago at the popcorn R-E-E-L. You know, he's got his barrel chest, he's accentuating his chat. It's just this bizarre, toxic, male peacock strutting that he was doing in the early 1990s in New York. And I just walked past him. I saw him. He smiled at me. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, you, sir, you're not even a sir, you're a disgrace, you know, come on. And then a few years later, he would announce on television that he was divorcing his wife. That was news to his wife, by the way. She found out watching live on TV. JFK Jr., and I'm sad he's no longer here. And some of these folks believe that well, I'm not even going to go there. I am leaving that alone. I am not going to even go there with this conspiracy garbage. But JFK Jr., I mean, I remember I remember the color Cody had on. He had this, um, actually, I don't remember. The, I, don't, I don't remember the rain Cody had on. <laughs> um, I remember him, though. I remember him. That was him. And um, smile as bright as the world. You know, this guy, uh, very cool, uh, dapper, um, self-possessed. And he, 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 had an air, he had an air of confidence. And you know that movie, American Beauty, where um, Peter Gallagher says, always project the appearance of confidence. I believe that I'm paraphrasing. American Beauty is not a good movie, by the way. And it won five Oscars. So they knew what they were doing at the Academy, didn't they? Yeah, Kevin Spacey was in that movie too. And he won an Oscar for it. He actually... Huh, Kevin Spacey. And he actually defeated my good... Well, he's not my good buddy, but I've met him a few times. Denzel Washington, who played Reuben Hurricane Carter. And all this, oh, we can't have... Oh, Reuben Hurricane Carter. We can't have... Oh, my God. There's no way we can have an actor win for playing him. Yeah, there's no way we can have an actor... Uh, playing a ch- uh, child uh, molesting uh, midlife crisis piece of crap in American Beauty. We can't have that, though, can we? Oh, hold my beer, said the Academy. Hold my beer. They said that in the year 2000. Hold my beer. Heck, I can, I can, hey, I'll see you that and I'll raise you. <laughs> it's just, good. oh my God. I, can I go on and on about that little situation? And I wonder if the Academy would take his Oscars away like they did uh, 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 Harvey Weinstein's. Oh, they took his membership away from the Academy. Whether they took his Oscars away is another story. I don't know. But could they do that to Kevin? Don't you think they should take away for those Academy members that might actually be listening to this? Do you think you could actually take away the Oscars from Kevin Spacey that he'd want? You know, the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the usual suspects and the... American Beauty. Can you take those Oscars from him? Do you think that that should happen, by the way? That's a whole nother conversation, though. I guess, because you know, someone will tell me, well, if you take his away, yeah, if you ran by that standard, we wouldn't have anybody having an Oscar now, would we? Well, maybe. Maybe not. You know, it all goes to credibility, doesn't it? Or is someone going to tell me it's about well, they're human beings. <laughs> someone in, someone will justify this. I know they will. But you won't. I won't. And you've got politicians here. 
You know, and I'm not even going to talk about all the ones that are infected by Dahl. I did talk about Giuliani and all these other people in that White House who got infected with this coronavirus. And and Herman Cain, can we not forget him? Can we not forget about Herman Cain? Because some people have. The guy died attending a Donald Trump rally. No mask. A black man in his 70s. No mask. No physical distancing. Oh, dearie me. You know, they still... Someone still tweets from him. You know, Herman Cain still tweets from his account, even though he's dead. I know that was in bad taste. I'm not trying to make fun of Herman Cain. Someone is tweeting from his account, though. And it's pretty goddamn creepy. It really is. All these politicians here in the United States who are violating these lockdown rules... Yeah, the, I've talked ad infinitum about Gavin and Gaviner. I, Gavin and Newsom. Gavin Newsom, the California governor. Ad infinitum. And then he gets angry when the media keeps bringing up that. And I know some of them do it to needle him. And he gave a very gruff response last week. I'm doing my job the way I can. That's just what I have to do. And then he kind of marched on to pivot away from that. There's a uh, Doug, Doug Sovereign of, uh, was it, uh, I don't know, KCBS News Radio had asked him this question during uh, his uh, pandemic press conference last week when he was announcing these restrictions that were imminent here in our state where we are under a three-week stay-at-home, stay-indoors predicament. And 36 million people now out of the 40 million people in this state. Three weeks. And by the way, do you want to talk about some madness? Here's the madness. Let me go back to this quickly. You know what the madness is in, 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 the, in England is? In England, right? They've got these tier one and two and three. Tier three being the most severe, right? And the most severe restrictions because of coronavirus. Tier two being not so much. And tier one, virtually no restrictions. And... London is going to probably be put into tier three next week. But that's not the issue. The issue is, is that for five days, beginning, I guess, on the 23rd or 24th of this month, Boris Johnson has the bright idea of abandoning the restrictions on the tier system so that people can mix and mingle for five days over Christmas, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, I guess, or 28th, whatever. Five days. They're opening all that up again. So all these restrictions, tier one, two, and three in England, are going to be abandoned for five days. (laughs) Where's the credibility, I say? Where, I ask, I ask you, where is the credibility? You got London Breeder, the mayor here in San Francisco, going to fancy dancy French restaurant, French laundry restaurant, up there in Napa, wine country here. You know, Gavin Newsom did the same thing. I've talked about that. All violating lockdown rules. You got Nancy Pelosi at a hair salon in September when there were rules about no salons open, no hairdressers open, no barber shops open. And there she was on camera. The security camera had her walking along. It was, wow, it was really bad. Hair half done or whatever. And then she said, I was set up. And no, you were not speaking Pelosi because you've been to that establishment for years. Then you've got, uh, you know, this Texas governor, uh, Texas mayor. Going off and, and sending a restrict. Don't go and travel because you know that's not good. He's in Mexico sending a video. <laughs> this is not funny. It's absurd. It's crazy. He's sending a video from Mexico telling you, please, dear, dear, <laughs> dear Texans, do not travel. This guy's in Mexico. You couldn't script this. Unless you wanted to slap someone in the face with the script. Like he slapped people in Texas in the face. I mean, it was abominable, mate. Abominable. 
and you've got the mayor of Denver. Uh, there's all these people, Democrats, Republicans. They, it doesn't matter. It's not about the party. It's about the behavior. And it's about setting a standard for leadership. And you absolutely undermine your credibility. Which is why when Doug Sovereign asked that question of Governor Newsom, no, well, don't you think that um, it, people won't listen to you, Governor, because you went to French Laundry? I'm paraphrasing. And don't you think that that it would be hard for you to earn their trust back because you did what you did? And Newsom got angry at him, snapped at him a little bit, got a little short with him, a little terse, shall we say. Didn't get angry at him. That's a little rough. He got a little snappy with him. And I know Gavin Newsom apologized. But this is the thing, right? This is the thing. And then you've got people in California who aren't wearing masks, who aren't doing these things. And they were behaving like that before Gavin Newsom went to French Laundry at the beginning of last month and, and whooped it up with 10 other guests for a birthday party for a lobbyist in a small indoor... Ra- People were doing this before Gavin Newsom. This ain't about Gavin Newsom. This is about the concept of credibility. And if you hold yourself out as a leader, as someone in the news media, who is supposed to be trusted and the most trusted name in news. I can't do James Old Jones's voice. I guess my own will have to do. But this is the key, this is the issue, credibility. And if our word doesn't matter, and if our trust is eroded, then where are we? What have we got? And so the solutions to all of this are to seek out people in media who actually are people with a strong established track record, people who do give you the news straight. And I've talked about some of the people, I've given you the recommendation, I'll include them in the liner notes. And turn off some of this stuff. Turn off every now and again, please. Take a break from social media. Every now and again, please. Take a break from watching the corporate news media, these cable networks I'm talking about. It will make a difference. It always does. But credibility, it turns out, is on the side of a milk carton. I think the All Points Bulletin is coming in a matter of time. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. Some news about Sky News now. A small number of Sky News staff attended a social event in London last Saturday evening, during which... COVID guidelines were breached. As a result of an internal review, Sky News presenter Kay Burley has agreed to be off air for six months and political editor Beth Rigby and correspondent Inzaman Rashid have agreed to be off air for three months. All of those involved regret the incident and have apologised. Everyone here at Sky News is expected to comply with the rules and the company takes breaches of this very seriously indeed.